after I finished preparing this sermon, I laid it aside and I looked back at the Christmas Eve sermons I preached last year and the year before. You remember them. Don't you remember them? I'm wounded. <laughs> well, I didn't remember them either. <laughs> but but as I read them, I began to, and I thought, wow, these are both really good sermons. They were both about the impact of our present day culture and the concerns that Christians have about the weakening of this special Christmas holy day. Remember? Okay. Just to jog your memory, 92% of Americans celebrate Christmas. 96% of all U.S. Christians celebrate Christmas, over two-thirds as a religious observance. Those are healthy and holy numbers. And from last Christmas, 91% of Americans will spend $6 billion at Christmas. Six billion. And surprisingly, not on themselves. That's not like us. And, and no, this is not charity, but it's getting closer. It's free will giving. Giving with the intent to delight another person. To fill them with joy. In a word, to bless them. So from that sermon in 2014, I'll quote, I think as Christians we may need to relax a bit, lighten up some about the commercialization of Christmas. Christmas is not getting dominated by the winter holiday crowd. Even if the angels disappear from the public squares and the lamppost signs say, Happy Holidays, Everybody pretty much knows that those new decorations point to the old-fashioned story that Don just read to you. That most wonderful of old stories. How God has made it clear with the birth of Jesus that he wants to do this thing we call life with us. O come, O come, Emmanuel. We have sung that for four Sundays of Advent. Emmanuel means God with us. So Christians believe that life is designed to be lived with God. We were not created with the potential to live life well alone. We can't exist without attending to God, but we cannot live life well without Him. Life is meant to be lived in cooperation, in collaboration, in relationship with the living God. And this is one of the great revelations of Christmas. In tonight's Gospel, and the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will come to all the people. Good news of a great joy. This, of course, is Jesus who has come among us. Another way of saying this, we will read in the Gospel tomorrow morning on Christmas Day from the Gospel of John. And the Word became 
flesh and dwelt among us. This is Jesus. Or as we famously quote all year round, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, which was Jesus. We are not alone. It is not good for us to be alone. Part of the great joy of Christmas was the surprising good news that because we do not have to be alone, life can actually be lived well. That was news to the religious Jews of the first century. For they had been trying to live life the way they thought God had designed it, and they knew they had failed repeatedly. They had been trying for centuries, working from this understanding that God gave the orders and people needed to obey them for life to go well. Now, how did that work for them? It, it seems as if this command and obey understanding of God began with Moses and that mixed multitude of people that he led out of Egypt and into the Sinai desert. Command and obey may be understood as a sort of emergency relationship that somehow became the norm, that became habitual. But when we go back to the Old Testament beginnings of our faith, it is clear that command and obey was not a good description of the relationship that Abraham had with the Lord. Abraham and the Lord talked, interacted, discussed. Abraham listened to God, which we need to do when we pray, and God, and this may be a shock, listened to Abraham. They were not exactly equals. Abraham was pretty careful how he spoke to the Lord. So, so the relationship was not that of equals, but it was certainly not as a drill sergeant talking to a recruit either. God had said to Abraham, I will be with you. I will be with you. And Abraham's life was lived out in the context of this continuing relationship with the living God who kept his word. And that is why Abraham is called the father of our faith. So when we sing, O come all ye faithful, the faith we refer to began with Abraham and is refreshed and renewed and clarified and expanded and empowered in Jesus. So how does this happen? How can people <coughs> who are ordinary people live life well? What does a life lived well look like? People who are living life as God designed it seem to be able to love the people that God has put in their way. They appear to be a blessing to those who are around them. This is beginning to look a lot like Christmas. People who live life well do so not because they are so religious, but because they are real and because they walk in those good works which the Lord has prepared beforehand for them to walk in. They are helpful. They lighten the loads of others. 
They are able to do this because the Lord has has lightened their load. They're not weighted down and wearied by resentment and unforgiveness. They can help bear the burdens of others, and this they do. People who live life well make life better all around them. People who live life well pray a lot. People who live life well worship at church, at home, at work, on the road. They are not alone. They pay attention to the Lord. People who live life well love goodness. And they are not afraid of evil. They know that on earth as well as in heaven, the goodness of God is more powerful than evil in any of its varied forms. So there actually are people who live life well. And these people understand and appreciate Jesus and his continuing work in the world. They want to be a part of it. They want him, Jesus, to help them to be helpful and to change in them whatever would block their usefulness. These people know that the answer to the question of life for them and really for the world and for all people is Jesus. God with us. God with us. Getting into relationship with him. Staying in relationship with him. Jesus, who with the Father pours out the Holy Spirit, Jesus, who by the Spirit reveals to us the glory of God the Father. Just being around his household helps us. Learning about him helps us. Coming to know him as he acts in our lives helps us. Being here tonight helps us. And tonight as we sing along with the angels in thanksgiving for the birth of Jesus, we will give thanks for another little child and baptize him in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this will be a cooperative collaboration with God. We will promise to do our part And God will certainly do his. We are saying to God that we intend this child, Dedrick, Dedrick, we intend this child, Dedrick, to be raised in the household of God and to come to know and to love Jesus. And God, hearing us, is saying back to us, I am giving him the Holy Spirit and marking him as Christ's own forever. As he grows, we are asking God to sustain him in the Holy Spirit that he might live life well. And we are asking that he be equipped for life. That is, for the living of life. And we ask, as we renew our baptismal vows, that we also may be re-equipped with an inquiring and discerning heart that he might speak to God and hear God speak to him. That is a gift of prayer. With courage and perseverance. For life can seem overwhelming perplexing and frightening. Have you guys noticed that? Overwhelming, perplexing, frightening. Courage, it's a gift of faith. We are praying that he be blessed with a desire to know and to love God. And that will make him a blessing to others.
That is the gift of Christian love. And we pray that he be given the gift of joy and wonder in life itself. We are not praying for this little guy to obey God's commands or else. Is that clear? <laughs> we are praying that he connect in a relationship with the living God, that he might live life well, with faith and prayer and love and thankfulness. And we thank God that Dedrick and we ourselves are not alone and are not unequipped. For many, many centuries in human history, baptisms in the church and festivals like Christmas, the Christ Mass, Christmas, were ways that helped children and adults make sense of life. By participating together, as we are doing tonight, people began to see more clearly. Through many of those centuries, most people did not read. There were few books. Bibles were scarce and were publicly read in Latin, which no one spoke. Yet the worship services and traditions of the church helped people to make sense of life and pointed them toward goodness. And all along, there were people who got it. People who were zealous for good works. People who prayed and loved and gave themselves to the needs of others. And for them, life was not overwhelming. Life was not perplexing. Life did not frighten them. Life was very interesting and very surprising and full of hope and full of joy. This kind of life is like Christmas all year round. This is the good life we pray for dead. This is the good life we pray for ourselves. May we, throughout the year, live Christmas lives that will bring glory to God and peace and goodwill among men. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.